as we were singing, I was thinking about several faces that I was seeing this morning and uh, that are out here and knowing that uh, God has changed their lives. And I was thinking as we were singing, God is love. Uh, how did it happen? It's because of his love. And all this is worth it. All this is worth it. Loving people is worth it. And then it changes others. And some of you have been changed. And we're so thankful. And we're so grateful. It's been a good journey. The journey's continuing. We've talked about journey, you know, this year. And it continues on. For some of you, it's going to look really different. Because this is your last chapel. And you're going to walk out. You're going to go to grad school. You're going to go to work. Uh, but you're, you'll continue the journey. And our prayer is that you'll always fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfect of our faith. And your journey will go well, even though there will be times that it will not go as planned. Uh, the song, He gives and He takes away, but we bless His name. It's good when He gives, we like that. But when He takes away, that's the hard part of the journey. And so I'm going to pray, and uh, pray over Scott, that uh, God will bless your journey. God, thank you. Uh, thank you for the fact that you have provided us good things and then you take things away but it's all a part of this journey that we're on and God we pray that as we walk this journey uh, that we'll have faith that we'll trust in you that we'll trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and God I pray that uh, as we close out this uh, school year as far as uh, gatherings uh, that you will speak through Scott. Thank you for the words he's prepared. And we just trust that your Holy Spirit uh, would uh, anoint his words and speak to our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And for his sake and glory. Amen. 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 Morning. Morning. One last stop along the way. Let me read to you from Mark 10. Peter said to him, we've left everything. Follow you. Tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions. And in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink. And be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me, Graham. Those places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. And instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even some man may come to be served or serve and to give his life as a ransom for me. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man named Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet.
but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Let's pray one more time. God, thank you for this day. And I pray your Holy Spirit to be present with us, move among us, open us up to hear a word from you, and please speak through me in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is the home stretch. And uh, I need to put in the, the cursory as as crucial as this time is, as much pressure as this is, there are, there are other things that, as, even as my faculty friends, I look them in the eye, there are other things that are more important. Don't let it stress you too much. And we do have a counseling center in case you just get to the boiling point. We'll, we'll help any way we can. But I've been just kind of joking around with people over the last few weeks and talking to people about, you know, it just, I know it's not possible, but it really does seem like there's a time warp. Once you come back from spring break, it's like time speeds up. And it just really, here we are with one day of classes to go. And so the theme all along has been journey. And, and this is the last stop, at least with, in terms of this journey. And I think it's appropriate that we look at this text. And this text has just really moved me this week, uh, really the last couple of weeks, been reading through this and, and didn't know what I would talk about today until just recently. And I thought, this is the text, because it is a text that is all about the movement of Jesus toward Jerusalem, the movement of Jesus toward the cross, and, and they're on the journey. But there's one last stop. And it's in Jericho. And it's with this guy named Bartimaeus. And I'm kind of I'm touched by this idea because as they get closer to Jerusalem, Jesus gets plainer. <laughs> and is laying it on the line, and yet they're missing it right and left. And he's, he's being as, as clear as he can possibly be about what matters. And so he's, he's got the 12, and they're trying to figure it out, and he is being plain spoken. I don't think you can get more plain spoken than this. Listen, we're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to the chief priests. They're going to kill me. And after three days, I'm going to rise again. And then immediately following that, uh, James, no, okay, 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 okay. But let's, let me tell you about my agenda. When you get into the kingdom, I want to be on your right and my brother on your left. How would that be? And it's just right over their heads. They don't get it. Mark and irony is seen the whole way through this book. Mark has been from the very beginning kind of having fun with the idea of who Jesus really is and the identity of Jesus. And all the way through, everybody's asking, who is this man, who is this man, who is this man? And nobody but the demons know who he is until about halfway through the gospel in Mark chapter 8, Jesus raises the question to them, who do, who do people say that I am? And Peter finally gets it right. You're the Son of God. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, you're right, but it's immediately, you know, we're still going. He got the right answer, but he still doesn't understand. And it gets as, about as plain as it can get right now, but they don't understand. And so then in typical Mark and irony, the only person who sees is a blind man. And I like that. So here they are, this one last stop, it's Jericho. And, and Jesus is on, on the way, and they're following, and there's just one last thing, one blind beggar by the side who, when he hears it's Jesus, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And they're trying to quiet him down. Because, again, their agenda and Christ's agenda are completely different, and so he doesn't have time for you, and they don't understand that for Jesus and in kingdom life, this is precisely the kind of person he has time for. Because Jesus is always about the individual. Jesus is always about a, a real one-on-one -on -one relationship where he wants you to come to him. He wants you, he wants me, 
He wants us to embrace the way of the cross. He wants us to take this, this idea of the last shall be first and the idea that if you really want to experience life and you really want to have the good life, then you've got to die to yourself. Take up your cross and follow Him. That even the Son of Man isn't among you as one who is served, but He's as, as one who serves. The Son of Man came, didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. That's the clear call of God on our lives. And here's what I know. That there are a bunch of you following Jesus. And praise God for that. And I'm following them too. I don't always follow them the best that I should. I've got all kinds of junk in my life, but I'm trying. I wake up every day trying to follow Him. And I know some of you are following, and some of you, though, are just like Bartimaeus. You're, you're on the side of the road. You're not in the road. That's a beautiful transition in this text. Bartimaeus is, begins on the side of the road. He's just a bystander. And at the end of the story, after Jesus heals him, and calls him, it says he followed him along the road. And so I, I want to say a word to, to any who are here who might be really just kind of, you know, I don't know if I'm in or out. My dad is an evangelist. He turns 80 May 1. He retired twice from preaching. Loved, loved sharing the good news with people. Came to faith as an, uh, an adult. Had a seven-year-old daughter a four-year-old daughter, a two-year-old daughter, and I was on the way in the summer of 1963. And they kind of realized they were in over their heads. <laughs> and so they, they, they came to the Lord. And it's changed their lives dramatically. And their whole lives have been about trying to share that with other people and just, just lead people to know Jesus. And so I have a rich heritage of that. And whenever I was 14 years old, my parents, my dad quit his job as a metallurgical engineer running a steel mill and went into preaching full time, planted a church. And so in, from, from 19, whatever year that was, 77 on, he's been a preacher. Retired, he said the first time he retired, I want to retire before I lost my fastball. <laughs> and... Uh, couldn't stay away from it, went back into it, and now he's retired a second time. But he told me a story about a, a guy that was a late comer to Jesus. He was a man that whenever they moved to Catanning, Pennsylvania, Allegheny River Town, about an hour out of Pittsburgh, he was one of the first people that they, they had a contact with, and they, they studied the Bible with him, and he was a man who was a good man, but he really didn't know if he wanted to follow Jesus or not. And so they, he, Dad said that... Uh, they would have these conversations and they would get down to the meat of, are you going to follow Jesus or not? And he would say with tears in his eyes, I just, I'm, I know what it says, but I'm just not ready to do that. And he said they did that so many times that dad finally said, I'm, I'm done. I can't do this anymore and you can't do it either. We'll be friends, but I'm going to leave it alone. And so that went on for years. Dad retired from that place, went to another place. Got a call out of the blue from this guy's brother, said, uh, my wife and I want to come down and, and we want you to baptize us into Christ, and they did. And so it was a neat moment. He immersed himself in the life of Jesus, said, I'm, I'm going to follow him all in. And later that night he said, I got, I got a favor to ask. He said, I want you to go see my brother. I want you to go see Richard. And Dad said, he told him that story. I can't do it. I can't do it. We've been through that. He said, I want you to give it one more try. He went and saw Richard, and, and uh, Richard finally, late in life, said, I want to follow. And so he did, and his wife did too. And sometime after that, his wife had some surgery. Everything well, went well in the surgery, but it didn't go well after the surgery. Blood clot went to her brain, and she spent the last few years of her life completely paralyzed. And Richard took care of her to the end. And when my dad did her funeral, he said to those grandkids, I want you to see what a follower of Jesus looks like. And I don't want you to ever let the story of your granddaddy's love for his wife die out. He came late to the party, but he came. And when he came, he understood what it was to follow Jesus. It means you deny yourself. 
For those that are wrestling with, am I going to follow or not? I, I had the great privilege of leading John Smoltz around this campus last summer. Had a lot of fun with him, even though I'm an old Pirate fan. He showed up. He'd broken my heart, the old pitcher for the Braves. I took him, showed him around campus, and we got talking about his faith journey. And he told me that he came to faith as an adult. He'd been playing baseball, and there was a team chaplain for the Braves. It was all the time, you need to give your life to Jesus. You need to follow Jesus. And he kept putting it off. And he said, he finally looked the guy in the eye and he said, here's the deal. What keeps me from just doing whatever I want to do until I'm good and ready and then late in life decide to follow Jesus? And the guy said, nothing. It's a free gift. You don't earn it. Nothing. He said, you, the trouble is you just might not make your timetable. And he said, that's all it took. And he made that decision immediately and gave his life to the Lord. And he said, everything changed. Are you beside the road or are you in the road? And let me be plain. I'm inviting you on a journey. And I'm saying there's always room for one more. Just like there was for Jesus. He stopped and called Bartimaeus. And I love that Bartimaeus said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Because what you need to know is what I know is that we all need mercy. There is not a bit of us, there is not one of us that deserves what God has for us. What we deserve because we're sinners and I'm on the front of the line, we deserve separation from God. That's what the wages of sin is. But God's free gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ His Son. And so what we need is mercy. And I want that mercy. And we can have that mercy. That mercy that, that transforms us and makes us more merciful. So, if you're like me and you need mercy, come on. But know that it's the way of the cross. That it's, you receive that gift, and then life is about giving yourself away, and as counterintuitive as that is, it's the sweetest thing going. Sunday, I had agreed to go preach in an old church I used to preach at, Voltee, over on Murfreesboro Road. It was about 500 members 20 plus years ago when I was there and Steve was there and we became friends back then. And now it's a handful of about 20 people, maybe a dozen, and they still meet and they meet on Sunday nights and it's been a long time since I went to Sunday night church, but I preached at it last Sunday night. And uh, my youngest was the only one in town and uh, so I said, you're going with me. And he said, I don't want to go with you. So we fought like cats and dogs. And, you know, that was an argument. I told him, I'm going to win this one. You're going. But he felt compelled to argue with me the whole way, even to the point of, you know, trying to get out before we rolled up to the church. So I went there, and uh, here's this church that is now almost gone. Had been over 1,000 members in its heyday. It's the life cycle of a church. And uh, when we were going out, he said, it's kind of sad. I said, well, yeah, it's kind of sad, but it's also kind of beautiful. Here's these people been together for 50 plus years, and they're all in community, and they're doing what they want to do on a Sunday night. They want to just go and study the Bible and sing some songs and love on each other. And there was one particular couple that, uh, that I saw, George and Willa Dean. Their son actually works for the university. His name's David. George and Willa Dean were there, and they came in, and, and George just kind of looked after Willa Dean. And uh, when it was all over, they were out in their car, and I pointed to my son. I said, Coley, you see that couple right there? He said, yeah. I said, uh, she has Alzheimer's. A lot of times she doesn't even know who he is. But he's serving her. And I said, buddy, that's what it's all about right there. Oh, 13 year old boy started hollering about like his old man is. I said, well, I didn't mean to do that to you, buddy. I'm just trying to tell you that's, that's what it's about right there. There's a guy that's serving his wife. He made a vow a long time ago. 
that said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, till death shall part us. And he's following Jesus. And he's not waking up every day saying, what's in it for me? He's waking up every day saying, maybe, maybe God will help me get through another. And he's taking care of that woman that he's loved all these years. And he's not getting much, if anything, in return. But uh, he's living the good life. And he's doing God's work. And I got to believe that in the darkness at three in the morning when he's really wrestling with how tough it is, he also knows the places what the psalmist would call uh, his men of being. That's the walk. That's the that's the call to you and to me. So as this journey up here comes to an end, I look at a lot of young faces and your journeys just begin. And I would say there's always room for one more. Follow this one who's on his way. Father, we love you, and I just pray that you'll help each of us to realize what matters and what doesn't. God, I'm, I'm struck by the irony of how what we know to be right is off right in front of us, and then we go grab it like James and John did. We want to look good. We want to be first. We want a title. We want prestige. Father, help us to follow Jesus in his service, wherever that leads today and for a lifetime. And God, we really do believe that's a good life. Help us to live what we believe. In Jesus' name.